I have a question about fear of abandonment. I have an answer about not being afraid of abandonment. <laughs> um, how? Stay. If you go, other people go. If you stay, other people stay. Thank you. You keep looking for the ideal one. I know you have found him, but beyond that point. We keep looking all the time for the safe zone, for certainty, for the ideal partner, for nirvanistic experience. And we keep moving all the time. How about we stop? And we realize, A, we are already complete. Not perfect, ladies and gentlemen. Complete. That completeness invites completeness. Mm. So then, nothing missing. Everybody is your friend. But if you keep looking for the ideal one, you abandon the time and space where you are. That's abandonment, even without realizing it. Because you keep running. If you don't run, that means you stay. You don't abandon anyone, then after a while, nobody abandons you. Um, I wanted to ask about working with tiredness and sleepiness during meditation, um, if you have any advice on that. And kind of specifically from my experience, I've kind of noticed that there's two kinds of um, tiredness in the meditation. Um, one is, I kind of call it physical tiredness. Just, you know, I didn't sleep well last night, I ate too much, I bowed a lot, so my body is tired, I fall asleep. And the other one is kind of more mental tiredness. I'm sitting and kind of at some point I realize I'm just kind of bored of this mantra, of this meditation. I just don't really feel like it today. I'm just kind of apathetic. I don't really care. And so kind of just the body says, well, I don't really care about this. So I just fall asleep. Um, so if you have any advice on kind of yes. finding the distinction between them and working with each one. Oh, absolutely. I give you a knife. Then just like your Kostu name, you put that knife under your chin. I tried it with my thigh. It did not work. I sat with a fork Trust and me, kept on poking. Trust me, knife is better. Knife? So you ah. put it here, and if you're bored for any reason, your head just... <laughs> oh my God. Kion Kostu name did 100 days like that. And be, believe me, nobody gives a rat's ass about fi kind of fatigue. Whatever distraction you have, whether it's your precious intellect or your earthly cover, your Hanan's body, it doesn't matter. You lose awareness, you lose the moment, you lose everything. So knife is very good because it just reminds you how fragile you are. And this is a soft spot. In your, in your... So Kyung Hussunim, he really got enlightenment like that. You can follow him. <laughs> we have meditation tomorrow morning. Let's find out. <laughs> the dog runs after the bone. Any other questions? Um, during my mil military service, um, I was depressed for about half of it. And I stopped thinking about it, and, and it didn't appear in my mind for a long time. And sometimes in my dreams and when I sit, um, it's different from another thought that arises. It, like, it, has some, um, it has some charge. I mean, when a thought about it arises, I mean, it's it hard to let go of it. So my question is, how can I let go of my past and be compassionate to myself? You can do it in two ways. One is focus on the moment only, and you ask, what is my correct job? If you're strong enough to do that, you stay in the moment. This moment becomes complete because you know your job. Moment to moment, keep that direction clear, keep that job clear, and you just do it. So if that works, it will take out all the energy from your past, focuses it at the present moment. And then it becomes empty. All your past karma just vanishes because it doesn't exist by itself. All karma has two aspects, energy and information. Information in this case is identification. So you stop the identification, 
and you stop providing energy to it, any dualistic or sensual relationship to your past, you don't think about it, you don't have emotions about it, you don't go back to those places where you were, you don't eat the same food, you don't smell the same smell, etc., etc., then this karma can disappear without a trace. And all you need is keep yourself at this moment with tolerance for distractions, sometimes falling apart, sometimes losing energy or losing sense why you're doing it. It's all included. Second, if you're not strong enough, then you have to fix your image of the past. And the first item on this list is knowing that this past only exists in your mind. Not out there anymore. So once you have realized that, you can go back and fix something in that image of the past, which enables you to focus on the present more and more and more. For instance, you said you'd been depressed during the army. Perhaps that's the time when you lose the reason why you had to take up arms to defend your country or your thinking was so heavy, or your emotions were so frustrated, you missed your family, your girlfriend, your dog so much, that your mind wasn't clear about it. Well, I was in the army too. One year of national service, not comparable to yours. But we had armed service, military exercises, all the bells and whistles, except our tech was far lower, our sense of danger was far lighter, and we were never in any kind of warlike situation, we just practiced. Well, I know with you guys, it's for real. Any moment, anywhere around your border, anything can happen, and you're trained for that. Now, we had a very important agreement, us, you know, pre-university soldiers. We follow the orders, we will never rebel against it. But if we have to leave the country to wage any conquest in terms of warfare or wartime activity, we would abandon the post and we would run. We are not ready to kill anybody just because the doctrine says so. But we are ready and able to defend our own country. And this is a very important point because it gives you an internal strength, some kind of ethics, something that holds your spine in the right place, that you are not just a little piece of a cogwheel in this huge clockwork of a military machine. Now, even in retrospect, it's not harmful to do that. Because then nobody can really compromise you. You follow the orders. You have to. But the moment that it is misused, you would be just a senseless piece of weapon to harm others. Then you would disagree and you would just go. So the view has to be fixed. And once you've done that, you can let go of all those things that you couldn't do. You can correct your mistakes. And you can promise yourself that if I ever have to go to the army again, my attitude will be like this and this and this and this. I know it seems a little bit superfluous. Zen always focuses on the moment. But if you remember the most important quote from the Diamond Sutra, it says, past mind, present mind, future mind cannot get enlightenment. That means if your mind is divided along time and space, you cannot wake up. So that separate perception, when you are divided, that division, that has to stop. If you have to go back to the past to fix a view, to fix some kind of karma, you fix it and everything snaps together in this moment. Nobody, nothing forces you to go back anymore and fix it. Thank you. You're welcome. So some psychologists talk about inner child and if it is broken, then when you heal it, having a healthy relationship with your inner child. Does that ring any bells? No. Okay. Child is happy very easily. <laughs> 
don't make anything, okay? So if we have a traumatic collection, we can label it. But it's a very fashionable concept, the inner child. People put so much behind it. People define it in so many ways. Look, I'm a Zen practitioner and teacher. In that way, a little bit barbarian. So, if I really want to put it into some useful term, some concept that we can all use, that would be our Buddha nature, our little Buddha inside. That inner child has the knowledge the attainment of eternity and enlightenment. But we should be very careful that it would not be just a conceptualization of all our desires from our dualistic mind. So clarity and practice which sustains this clarity, that's paramount not to misidentify or misrepresent this inner child. So the adult mind that is deluded, that's the hindrance. If we practice, our Buddha nature is clear and bright. And if you want to put it into some shape, you can do this with the inner child. But originally, it's not necessary. If we play psychology, we can do that. But how many children do you have inside? How many adult personalities do you have inside? Do you have one child, one adult? Who's looking at it? You see? So for expedient means, we talk about Buddha nature because originally it has no name, no form. For expedient means, for some therapeutic purposes, we can talk about the inner child as a, a prime member of our archetypal reality. We can do that. But originally it doesn't exist. So if we have the right attitude, we have the right view, then we have the right experience. The right view is that everything is created by mind alone. And if I want to look at a certain batch of karma, and if I label it, then it exists. If I don't label it, it's still there, but not in the same form, not in the same way of existence. It's just there. So the concept of inner child is not some kind of magic not something universal. But it, I think, describes our potential to go beyond dualities, to have unconditional love, to feel oneness with another being. We all want that. And if we are clear enough, we can get that. First of all, we have to be able to give that. So if you want to build up the conceptual inner child, it will be fake. If you lose your attachments to any idea of self, then what remains, this clarity, can be personified as such. And then you can work with it and help others. But originally, it does not exist. We have to be very clear about that. So if something were to come up... Um that I could relate to my childhood because I'm making that connection, I am giving it form and I am labeling it as that. Look, you can have your childhood memories compounded into your inner child, but that's your childhood experience. Mm -hmm. It has not much to do with your Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. But the mind was pretty much the same, the innocent, the sometimes immature, the inexperienced, okay? That's why before thinking and beyond thinking, they can meet. But when your childhood goes into place and everything is settled, you put your traumas into the right place, then and only then your inner child begins to function. Mm. Not before. Before that, some remains of infantile karma. Mm. But your inner child originally has this brightness, love, compassion, completely not attached to thinking, playfulness, spontaneity, intuition, innate wisdom. Should I go on? Well, 
that's why, that's why it takes a lot of effort to find it, because mm. it's so close mm. and so obvious. And we always misidentify it with something else, with our memories, with our traumas, with our karma, okay? So continuing practice and staying equanimous and not labeling, that is the way to clear mind. And what we cannot list tonight, but can still appear. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, today I took a walk in the forest and I look at the trees and mm, the birds and the animals and they saw they live very <coughs> freely. Mm, without intention, honoring the moment. Mm, and the universe just take care of them, of anything. Who and told you that? I saw. What the did you see? Com the sun comes in the morning. You saw the sunshine, you saw the animals. Did they tell you how free they are? Did they express happiness that they don't have to pay taxes? That's all your idea that they have an easier and better or free life than humans. If you look at the actual laws of the animal realm, they are brutal. Nobody wants to get back there as humans. Some tribes from the Amazon rainforest were extracted by force and put into cities. Terrible story from the 60s and the 70s. And a couple of decades pass, new government comes and they apologize. And they say to these folks in big housing estates or favelas in South American cities, we can repatriate you back to the forest. Would you like to go back? And they said, no. We suffered enough first from you. Next, we saw what kind of life we left behind. We're not going back. So the animal realm is brutal. We think it's better because they don't pay taxes and they don't have to have social security and they don't have to submit papers and they don't have to drive cars. They don't have to have parliaments and laws and systems, what not. And definitely, I have seen no animal using Facebook. So that's big relief for them. <laughs> but it doesn't mean their life is better. Okay? Most animals are either hunters or the hunted no middle ground. Of course, you can see these cute videos on YouTube and one dog caresses a cat and carnivorous animals still care for herbivores, etc. That's the exception or somehow made. But we have ideas of the animal realm that are just not true. They are illusory. If animals could actually comprehend that, they would laugh at us. They would scream at us. They would call us stupid humans, which we are actually most of the time. Animal is animal. They have animal karma. Human is human. We have human karma. And the biggest difference is that we consciously say I, because this chakra is open. Okay? It's conscious. With animals, as intelligent as they are, I mean, my favorite, I mean, the dolphins, horses, big birds, they are wonderful. They are intelligent. In fact, they are more intelligent than human beings, but they are not conscious. They cannot divert from their program. Have you seen a dog behaving in an undogly way? But you have seen humans behaving in an inhumane way. That's the difference. Huge difference. But it's not better for them or worse for us or vice versa. Discover the laws of the animal realm. Then you understand them, comprehend them. Maybe you can even help them. But it's not better for them or vice versa. Okay? <laughs>